is unfortunate. Um, but there uh, we see the uh, horrific scene on the uh, southern end of the island of Manhattan. Much of it has been evacuated throughout this day. There have been uh, rescue officials trying to get to the area where the buildings crumbled into the ground. Uh, the problem is the uh, emergency crews say that the situation has been just too dangerous for many hours throughout today to get anywhere near the, uh, the rubble to work on any possible rescue attempts. Other uh, um, items coming up uh, tonight, first of all, Kadi, we've been saying, uh, and I believe it's still the case, uh, Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki are expected to uh, brief the press uh, again in the neighborhood of 6 o'clock, just really moments from now, but that may be a little bit later than that, but Let we'll bring that to you live. Show you what was handed to us just now. Special this edition the, of the Post. The front page of the Post, special edition. It says, terror just destroy World Trade Center. Uh, and then 9 o'clock tonight, uh, President Bush. We have gotten confirmation now that President Bush is going to go on national television tonight to uh, address the nation uh, about this tragedy. Now, you've, you've been keeping up with the school situation a little bit more. Let's take a look at what, uh, okay. what the, the young folks uh, have tomorrow. All right, so here is the very latest. This has changed throughout the day, but right now the information we have is this, that public schools in New York will be open tomorrow except for the New York um, Archdiocese. Their schools are going to be closed. Um, the New York Archdiocese, until further notice, I assume, but definitely closed tomorrow. And uh, the spokesman uh, for the Archdiocese, Joseph Willing, says the schools outside of Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island will then reopen on Thursday. But again, I suggest that you call your, your kids school and see what's going on individually. Right, everything is in, in flux right yeah. now. Uh, do we have Jerry Howard on the phone? Uh, Mr. Howard, Jerry Howard, you, you, you will recognize uh, Jerry Howard if you watch local news in New York at all at, this, at the site of virtually every uh, uh, mishap, uh, disaster, collapse, breakdown. Um, he was there. He was the uh, director of the emergency management office uh, up until I think about uh, a year ago. Mr. Howard, are you with us? I sure am. Tell me about, uh, for, you, you were there until about a year ago, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, this, you, you as, as much as anyone, uh, is responsible for the operation of New York City's emergency management office through some pretty sure. tough times in recent years, but now, but now this. What, uh, as somebody who, who's, whose job this is, what did you think when you saw this this morning? Well, this is an absolutely uh, devastating event. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this was an attack on, on the country. Uh, this was uh, a very calculated um, uh, attack uh, by by cowards uh, that um, you know was designed to kill many people. Um, you know, I think that uh, when you look at this type of an incident uh, and uh, its potential impact, it's it's got significant ripple of effect. Um, but I think at this point in time, you, we we have to look at uh, how we can help the families. Um, the, the victims, uh, the, the many firefighters and police officers that were lost today. And I think the focus really has to be on that. And in due time, I think that uh, our, our federal government, the president, has vowed to um, go after the, the people that uh, perpetrated this horrific act. And I think we have to have faith in that. When you were in that job, uh, running the emergency management office, and you would sit around and brainstorm and think of worst case scenarios which i know was was really an important part of the job was, was preparation right. for anything that might happen did you discuss something like this we discussed major incidents we absolutely did we discussed incidents with um, hundreds and hundreds and uh, you know thousands of victims uh, one of the reasons that we entered into mutual aid agreements with new jersey and with um, westchester nassau suffolk county uh, was to have medical resources, police and fire resources readily available for uh, an event that uh, it just uh, created large, large numbers of casualties. Um, this, um, the event that occurred today is almost uh, uh, surreal. Uh, it is just um, uh, hard to imagine um, an event like this occurring. But we're dealing with uh, from a, a short time ago saw the tail end of a large airliner plunge into the Pentagon. 
I was in the building because I was driving a friend. No one worried for her safety. The World Trade Center is, is no more. This is a live picture at the column of smoke and ash still billowing up from the lower Manhattan area of New York over the skyline, which will now be forever changed as terrorists today crashed two hijacked jetliners into the World Trade Center and brought down the twin 110-story towers. Another hijacked commercial jetliner crashed into the Pentagon in Washington. Good evening to you. I'm Brian Williams. It is 6 p.m. on the East Coast, 3 p.m. on the West Coast on what has been one of the most horrifying days in American history. Terrorists carrying out well-planned, well-coordinated attacks that have left perhaps thousands dead, thousands more injured. President Bush is vowing to hunt down those responsible. He is due to address the nation tonight at a time yet to be announced. This all got underway at 8.50 a.m. Eastern Time as American Airlines Flight 11 hijacked after leaving Boston Logan Airport for Los Angeles LAX with 92 people on board, crashes into the south tower of the World Trade Center, leaving a gaping hole. There are gaping holes in the building and at the top floors in flames. Then at 9.08 a.m. Eastern Time, United Airlines Flight 175, en route from Washington to Los Angeles with 65 on board, crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The entire terrifying scene captured on videotape as it happened. Then, 9.30 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77, carrying 64 people from Washington to Los Angeles, crashes at the Pentagon outside Washington, the heart of the Defense Department. One of the building's five sides collapses. Then, between 9.50 and 10.30 a.m., both towers of the World Trade Center collapse. It's estimated up to 50,000 people might have been working there on an average day. Thousands more can be visiting at any given time. 10 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93, carrying 45 people from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, crashes 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There are rumors the plane may have been headed for either the White House or the U.S. Capitol. Amid all of this, emergency measures are being taken from coast to coast in this country, including evacuations at the Capitol and the White House. The FAA has grounded all air travel until at least noon to tomorrow nationwide and we're going to dip in now as the crisis seems to be continuing overseas in one form or another as part of an agreement today among news organizations to share all news gathering we have these pictures of what is going on in Kabul Afghanistan right now these are coming in via a digitized video phone where we have just watched missile attacks in the skies over Kabul Afghanistan anti -air Aircraft rockets in the air, explosions and tracers visible in the night sky. Kabul is the seat of power in the nation of Afghanistan, and you see there in the distance a line of flames. What we're lacking here is context, connection between what happened today, the events that may change life in the United States of America, and what is happening half a world away tonight in the dark, in the skies and on the ground in Kabul, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, but these are live pictures coming in via CNN uh, on a video phone. Let's begin our coverage with this in mind with NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell in Washington. Andrea, what are we watching? What's its connection? Difficult to know what we are watching, but it would be if there if they are missile attacks, it would most likely be American retaliation against Kabul because we had warned the Taliban leaders of Afghanistan that if there were any evidence indicating that Osama bin Laden, whom they've been harboring for many years, 
was responsible for today's attacks or for any other attacks, that we would retaliate. This warning has been communicated to the Taliban leaders uh, directly and indirectly over the course of many weeks. They denied today any involvement by bin Laden, but we have been told by top officials in the United States government that they are 90% sure that bin Laden was responsible. I don't think we would have been told that if they didn't have enough evidence to retaliate. So what you may be watching, and I should stress, Brian, that we don't know the source of this video, but what you may be watching is tracer attacks, uh, signs of missile attacks on Kabul, and it, if that is the case, it could well be a U.S. retaliation for what happened today. Andrea, the missiles were earlier visible in midair, and the trails behind them were consistent with uh, what we've seen to be uh, cruise missile attacks in the past. Now we see the, the flames flaring up in the center of the lens. Uh, we're going to pause just a minute. We'll dip into the audio of their coverage. We'll come back and talk further about what is underway tonight. First, we're seeing the flash, and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards, and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from us. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds that could be thunder and lightning. However, there's a possibility that those reflections are missiles landing elsewhere, uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds. But it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen infighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan. And the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that the Afghanistan would be attacked. He said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson. There Andrea is Mitchell, uh, back in the Washington Bureau on this so day when, say? if nothing else, we have learned to expect anything and not to trust anything. We've had false reports of a car bomb at the U.S. State Department and a plane landing at, at Camp David. Uh, if, Andrea, this was indeed an American uh, cruise missile attack, retaliation, uh, what footprints would the attack on the U.S. have to have left behind? Well, we've apparently lost touch with Andrea Mitchell in Washington. John Palmer is at the Pentagon for us tonight. John, perhaps you can uh, handle that question. Uh, and the question is, what footprints would the attack on the U.S. have to have left behind for retaliation to come so swiftly, it being just past 6 p.m. here in the East now? Brian, they would have to have certainly hard evidence uh, to trace this back to bin Laden to uh, carry out this particular attack. It's been unusual today because officials have been rather outspoken, pointing fingers. And as uh, Andrea Mitchell reported a short time ago, that's a little bit unusual this early. Just a short time ago, a number of reporters were picked up. We're about a half a mile from the Pentagon. As you can see behind me, that huge, horrible, gaping hole in the west side of the Pentagon where the hijacked American airliner crashed about 9.30 this morning. The officials from the Pentagon came over and picked up a group of reporters to take them over for a briefing. And I'm sure the uppermost question on everybody's mind is going to be, what about this retaliation? Is it underway? And, uh, and what's going on? And how is this particular uh, uh, tragedy traced directly to them? Now, John, uh, as we look at the damage, uh, uh, retrace a little bit the, the events of this day. The attack had just taken place in New York. Uh, the government as a whole was reacting to that. Uh, suddenly, and this was close to a, a landing pad there at the building, one of the five sides, as you just pointed out, having collapsed, suddenly all those at work and the death toll hovering around at 100 felt the concussion. 
Yes, uh, let's go back to about 9.30. Most of the people in this building were glued to television stations and television sets watching the, what was unfolding with the World Trade Center in New York City. And then shortly after 9.30, there was a huge blast. There were shouts in the hallways. A little bit later, smoke then filled the hallways. Uh, people dashed out. An alarm went off at the Pentagon for people to leave. We are told that uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld himself left his office, which is on the far side of the Pentagon, ran around to this gaping hole, this, uh, this side of the Pentagon on the west side, and uh, personally tried to help some of the people to, to, to get them out there. This occurred about 9.30 this morning, and hundreds of firemen have been battling the blaze now for more than eight hours. They have it well contained, but many areas have not been searched for casualties simply because of the flames and smoke. John Palmer at the Pentagon, thanks. We're going to go back across town to our Washington bureau. Andrea Mitchell, we had, uh, we had missile trails in the sky over Kabul, Afghanistan. What have you learned about this, Andrea? According to senior officials, they do not believe this is an American attack. This is not from the Pentagon. Let me be clear on my sourcing. It is from another intelligence agency. But they do not believe that this is a U.S. attack. They think uh, possibly this is dissidents in Kabul, but be very careful. Uh, we have no confirmation at this point that the U.S. is retaliating against Afghanistan. All right. So uh, tonight, on this day that has seen an unprecedented attack on the uh, continental United States, missiles in the air over Afghanistan. Uh, it would seem to most pros that it would be awfully early for any kind of retaliation. And indeed, uh, Andrea Mitchell's source is telling her uh, that would be correct, that this is not uh, U.S. sponsored in any way, that it may be some other elements. But that is the picture tonight in Kabul, Afghanistan, again, on what has been a uh, horrendous day in the United States, a day that may change the U.S. way of life. Lower Manhattan has been the epicenter of all of this beginning this morning. Most recently, it was the scene of yet another building collapse, one of the victims of today's earlier attack, really, by two hijacked aircraft full of passengers, and it is alleged hijacked pilots at the controls instead of the commercial jet pilots. Our own Ashley Banfield is in Lower Manhattan, where number seven World Trade Center was the latest building to collapse late this afternoon. Ashley? It's about 45 minutes ago, it went down right behind us, just a thunderous cloud of dust again passing through the streets of Manhattan. Brian, it's happened four to five times already today. It was standing right behind us, as I said, at about 5.30 Eastern time. We had been warned they were just waiting for this one to come down. The windows had already blown out. It had been an inferno for hours. We'd been cleared five different times northward from, the, uh, from ground zero, where the first and second World Trade Centers came down just after about 10 or 11 this morning. And every time we moved, there was this concern there'd be other buildings that went down. It was rather strange, but I was doing an interview with a, a woman and a small baby who were evacuating their apartment not far from this area when number seven came down. Here's a look at the tape. You can see what happened. Please be careful of your baby. Oh, my God. Look behind us. Please pan in this way. Please be careful of your baby. This is it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No. No. We're, listen. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. We're okay. I think we're okay. Ashley, I think we're okay. You're gonna all right. We're going to have to move this way. We're going to have to move. We're going to have to move. That cloud is coming this way. Yeah. The concern is that the cloud was uh, potentially going to be moving this way. The wind kept it eastward from us. We could maintain our position here on the perimeter. I just want to show you, Brian, from here down on the ground level in Manhattan, what some of the things that have been collected from the street can show us. I don't know if you can zoom into here, Michael, but uh, these papers were collected from one and two World Trade Center. The headers on them say those addresses here, the 81st floor deliveries, the 87th floor deliveries, the 90th floor, the 92nd floor, what kind of parcels have come in. They were found scattered within a mile. Also this I just wanted to show you as well. These are what were being cut as tourniquets for a lot of the, uh, the triage stations that were set up in the uh, treatment areas. I can also tell you that a police officer who had been down in that dust zone for the better part of the entire day told me that a, a morgue had been set up, the location of which wasn't being disclosed, but that most of the bodies, take a look at this if you can, as this, as this vehicle goes through. That's evidence of what it, we've seen a lot of today. Police and emergency vehicles covered in the Mount St. Helens type dust and also the windows blown out, an ambulance 
also burned all along one side. The window's blown out of it as well. The ambulance driver passing through here and telling me this ambulance was new this morning. It's really just an unbelievable scene, Brian. All right, Ashley Banfield in Lower Manhattan. It was an unbelievable day for the traveling White House. We may never know the threat assessment as seen against this president today. This day saw him start out in Florida, then move to two different Air Force bases, one in Louisiana, one in the Midwest, before being en route back to Washington tonight, where we have learned he will address the nation on television. Because the White House was evacuated, the Vice President and First Lady were taken to safe places. NBC News correspondent Bob Kerr is doing his work out of FBI headquarters that has become the de facto White House briefing room this evening. Bob, good evening to you. Brian, good evening. Uh, on the phone this time because we have moved. A small group of us now are the first to be let in back to the White House. I have just uh, cleared security, and uh, you know the walk. I'm walking down the uh, through the northwest gate into the driveway, looking straight at the west wing as we speak. So a small group of press now being allowed back in here to the White House. What's odd, Brian, is that tonight, a little while from now, there was supposed to be a joyous and gala barbecue on the south lawn, a barbecue for uh, Congress uh, put on by President Bush. Obviously, that is not going to happen. Uh, the president himself was out of town today and kept out of town for a good while. Uh, first in Nebraska, uh, rather first to a Louisiana Air Force uh, facility, and then to a Nebraska Air Force base from where he will uh, come back here to the White House. Uh, also, for that matter, the congressional leaders, we're told, were also spirited out of town to uh, protect them. Um, I can tell you, Brian, we made a, a seven-block walk from um, the FBI building on 10th Street up here to the White House on 17th. It was and rema it's remains a ghost town in Washington. You could look down one of the major streets and see nothing but traffic lights and white lines, no cars. In one case, we saw a big fuel tanker truck escorted by two police cars moving quickly down one of the main streets. Uh, as you know, President Bush today has uh, spoken about this uh, uh, attack on the United States twice, calling it a national tragedy, calling the incidents cowardly acts and uh, terrorism against the United States, which he says will not stand. Here's a bit of what President Bush had to say in a statement this afternoon. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Brian, back here at the White House now, again, a small group of us being allowed in, uh, awaiting, we think, what will be a statement from President Bush after he arrives here. Uh, a parting uh, thought for you. One of the sights that was um, utterly unreal here today was in the skies above the White House and the National Mall in Washington on at least three or four occasions uh, one could look up and see fighter jets crisscrossing in the sky. Uh, there were obviously no commercial planes around. All that had been shut down. Instead, there were uh, flights, overflights by, uh, by jet fighters uh, in and around the area of the White House and the Mall. Bob Kerr back inside the White House after a day outside the White House. And for those just joining us, that is indeed Lower Manhattan you were looking at earlier. What's different about the skyline? The World Trade Center, the landmark Twin Towers, both gone. The death toll is staggering. So many people from all walks of life, and it is destined to grow throughout the evening and throughout the days ahead. Among those who died is Barbara Olson. She had a long career in public service, was a television commentator, and the wife of the U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. 
Barbara Olson, a frequent contributor on NBC News broadcast, was 45. She was on board the plane that crashed at the Pentagon today. For more on the four different commercial aircraft that were hijacked, we go to NBC News correspondent Jim Cummins at American Airlines headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas tonight. Jim, good evening. Good evening, Brian. That's right. It was outrageous and audacious. Hijacking four commercial airliners, two You're watching News Channel 2. This is a 24-hour news update. Hi, I'm Ann Shea. And I'm Tom McClanahan. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. The attack on America is keeping all of us close to our televisions. Right now, we'll bring you the latest on how this event is hitting close to home. Terre Haute Mayor Judy Anderson and nine other community leaders are in Washington, D.C. right now. They were meeting with the Bureau of Prisons and were scheduled to return to Terre Haute today. Of course, they have been grounded in D.C. They're staying at the Hay Adams Hotel, which is right across the street from the White House. We spoke with both Chamber of Commerce President Rod Henry and Mayor Judy Anderson earlier today about their experience. Breakfast, and would you believe uh, the hotel that we're in is directly across the street from the White House? So, we uh, all the commotion started early in the morning, about nine, around 9:15, 9 9:30. 9 uh, but it was all only talking about the World Trade Center, and it wasn't until uh, we were kept eating and, and realizing and worrying about that that we realized the Pentagon also had been hit. Um, and the the hotel said if you went to the terrace, you could see the smoke and you could see all the commotion. And obviously, they closed the terrace off right away. So we're in a beautiful hotel. We're right across the street from the White House. And right now, there's not a soul around. Uh, they have blocked everybody totally away from the hotel, a block away uh, with the yellow tape. And no one is allowed to come up this way unless you have a key to get in the hotel. So there's lots of security. There's lots of sirens. There's, um, it's just like almost like a dead, dead place right now. Our plans are to, our, our, our uh, normal plans were to be leaving. Uh, tomorrow, uh, mid-afternoon, um, out of Baltimore, Washington Air International Airport. Uh, yeah. But I'll be on the telephone tomorrow morning because basically we're done. There's nothing more we're going to do. Right. Um, we're just going to stay put right now at the hotel, not do much. Uh, we'll probably go out to a nearby restaurant after a while and then come back here and just, That's like cool. everybody else, just huddle around the TV together and watch this thing continue to unfold. Tom, I mean, the mayor uh, came up with the idea that we ought to go give blood while we're out here, and we did. We headed towards the uh, uh, a blood center not far from the hotel, but we got there, and the, uh, the people came out and said, we have at least a three-hour wait, mm -hmm. and they said, we close at 7, and frankly, we don't think we have enough medical supplies to take care of everybody. Right. So they've asked us to come back tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and we're going to try to do that. So. A lot of reaction from people there in Washington, D.C. Back here at home, churches all over the area are holding prayer vigils this evening. News Channel 2's John Swanner is at United Memorial Methodist Church on Poplar Street in Terre Haute. John, what's the mood there? Well, the services are set to begin very shortly at 5.30. They're just a few minutes away, and I am joined by the associate pastor, Steve Buck, and the pastor, Bruce Buckley. And um, first of all, gentlemen, um, why hold this type of a service on a day like today? Well, this is an opportunity for people of the community to gather together in mutual aid and support and prayer during this time of uh, great national crisis. So more or less an outlet for them to uh, display their feelings about this. Yeah, everybody wants to respond to some kind of a, an emergency like this. And we're not in New York, we're not in, in Washington, we can't go move bricks, but we can all come together in, in, a, in an attitude of prayer. Okay, what type of a, a service are we expecting today? We're going to have a, a brief service. The point is to bring people together, to remind them that God is in charge even when things like this happen in the world, and, and remind them that their, their job is to be there with them, with those who have been impacted through prayer. And um, what do you hope to accomplish, Pastor, with this service? Well, a sense of uh, mutual support and bond, bonding, perhaps. Many people have uh, differences of opinions about what we ought to do or how we ought to respond. But uh, we seek the will of God in, in what we ought to do, and we come to pray about that. Perhaps it's important to remember uh, the words of, a, of an old hymn mm -hmm. that written by Isaac Watts. He wrote, mm -hmm. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, mm -hmm. and our hope for America is for years to come. Okay, very kind words. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, the services are set to begin at about 5.30, just one of several 
in the area. Tom, and back to you. Thanks a lot, John. One major concern at this hour is the gas prices we're all hearing about. Some stations are reporting prices over $5 a gallon. This is causing a panic. People are flocking to gas stations and causing major mm -hmm. traffic hazards. Emergency personnel are fearing a possible gas shortage if the current rate of sa gas sales continues. We have been assured by oil distributors that these prices are only temporary and it's in everyone's best interest to not panic if you can wait to gas Wait. The local chapter of the American Red Cross has volunteers on hand helping families who have relatives in the New York City or Washington, D.C. area. If you need assistance finding a family member, you can contact the Red Cross at 812-232-3393 by dialing that same phone number. You can also make a monetary donation as well as learn how to become a Red Cross volunteer. We will continue to bring you local updates that is, as they are warranted. For now, we send you back to NBC News in New York. Country. So the United States has to take the lead. You're a veteran attorney. What, uh, what about when uh, that increased surveillance, increased security runs up against the Bill of Rights? Well, we've been able to solve those problems in the past. Uh, Brian, I think there will be an awful lot of cooperation from of the American people and the courts in recognizing that this is a dire American emergency and one that we'll, uh, we'll have to do it within the context of our Constitution, but I'm confident that we can. I want, you to, I want to get you on record on the uh, uniquely American ability to put party labels aside and fall in line behind the chief executive during times of great national strain. Well, we've done it over and over again, and clearly we will do it this time as we have so often in the past, as we did uh, in 1941 after Pearl Harbor, as we did indeed uh, after the riots in 1967 and 68. We recognize that we're in a situation where we're going to have to act together. We're going to have to act to be unified and put partisan bickering to one side. Uh, as rapidly as we can. Is there anything worse about this vis-a-vis -vis Pearl Harbor in that we still don't know who the enemy is? Yes, that's certainly right. Uh, there you had a, you could focus on a particular enemy, find ways to combat this, but uh, them, but under the present circumstances, we're going to have to take some time and find out who did it and how to react. Uh, well, Mr. Secretary, uh, after what's been a, a, a very uh, a, a tough day in this country, when you uh, look back at the events of the last couple of hours, uh, you look at uh, what had been passing for domestic political issues, in addition to this changing day-to-day -day life in the country, do you think this will change the access of the entire argument? Do you think this will increase now interest in things like your stock and trade foreign affairs? Uh, there's no doubt that it will. I think we're going to have to understand where this came from. We're going to have to understand who our enemies are around the world, and we have to understand who our friends are. I would hope and expect that all the civilized world will join us in combating this, not just our NATO allies, but China and Russia as well. We need to get together in the civilized world to combat this. And in, on Capitol Hill, I think there will be a whole new set of issues I don't expect to hear much talk about uh, what happened to the surplus in the, in the coming days. Did we get too lax? Uh, did we get too carried away with the end of the Cold War? Uh, yes, I think that there was some laxity, much as there was before Pearl Harbor. We perhaps were too confident about uh, we are a long ways away from the terror of the Middle East. I'm not saying this came from there, but it bears many of the earmarks of that. Uh, four suicide bombers or groups of suicide bombers because those planes probably weren't taken over by a single person. You can just imagine what went on on board those planes. So it bears some marks of a society, a, a group of people that we simply don't understand and can't comprehend. But that doesn't mean we can't take full action in, in meeting it, even though we may not be able to comprehend it tonight as we sit in our stunned uh, uh, concern for the people in New York and Washington, D.C. Former Secretary of State Warren Christopher, as always, sir, sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Brian. For those of you watching us on the NBC Television Network, stay tuned for a special 90-minute edition of NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. For those of you with us on MSNBC on cable, stay with us for uninterrupted coverage of this attack. I'm Brian Williams, NBC News. <laughs> A 
Attack on America, a special edition of NBC Nightly News. Terrorists declare war on the United States, hijacking jetliners, crashing them into New York's World Trade Towers. Another airliner into the Pentagon, threatening the seat of national power. Thousands likely dead, downtown New York in chaos. America wondering, what next? on Midtown Manhattan, and tonight America is at war with terrorists after a stunning series of attacks today against targets in New York and in Washington, D.C., the World Trade Center, and the Pentagon. The terrorists use hijacked civilian airliners and their passengers as guided missiles in their attack, the most serious attack on this country since Pearl Harbor, and tonight, the dead still are being counted. An unknown number still are missing. At this hour, in this war, another development. There are reports out of Kabul tonight, the capital of Afghanistan, of explosions. But the Pentagon and the CIA are flatly denying that the United States had anything to do with those explosions. This has been one of the darkest days in America, and it is not yet over. Here at home now, a quick look at the locations where the four airliners hit. The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan 20 minutes apart. Then, within an hour this morning, the Pentagon. And then, the final crash just minutes later, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, 266 people on the four airplanes alone, all presumed to be dead. At the World Trade Center, even nine, more than nine hours now after this disaster began, officials do not know how many people were killed, how many still are trapped in all the rubble. We do know that on most days there would be at least 20,000 people at work in the World Trade Center at the time that the airliners crashed into those twin towers. Another 90,000 could be expected in the vicinity of those towers in the course of an average workday. And of course, scores of police, firefighters, and other emergency personnel were in the area when the buildings came down. We're gonna get the view now from the White House and our correspondent there, Campbell Brown, also from the Pentagon and from Jim Mikloszewski. And I'm going to jo join now with a complete account of what this day has been like from NBC's David Bloom, who's been my colleague all day long. David, bring us up to date. Well, Tom, more than nine and a half hours since the first attack, the smoke billowing from the hulks behind me is now more gray than black, indicating that the fires have diminished somewhat, but it's still an extremely dangerous situation. Just within the last hour or so, a third building, a 40-story building, also collapsed. 40 more stories of concrete, steel, and iron crashed into the ground. A makeshift morgue has been set up near the World Trade Center. New York City police still stacking to their early estimates that the casualties ultimately may number in the thousands. Nothing more precise than that. We've put together a chronology of the events as America's watched, dumbfounded, and yes, outraged and defiant. The first attack plane, a hijacked American Airlines flight out of Boston, slams into the North Tower of New York's World Trade Center at approximately 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. The explosions and fireballs broadcast live by television helicopters, which then horrifically spot the second attack plane, a United Airlines flight hijacked from Boston, taking dead aim at the World Trade Center's South Tower. It's now approximately 9.03 a.m. Where the hell can I meet you? Oh. I'm across the street from the Marriott, man. A second airplane, a 727 just ran into the building. Emergency officials estimate 20,000 or more people may have been inside the two 110-story buildings at the time of the attacks. Eyewitnesses report victims falling, and in some cases, jumping from the two buildings. But there were people falling out of the sky. At 9.29 a.m., President Bush in Florida addresses the nation for the first time. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. But in the nation's capital, just 11 minutes later, 9.40 a.m., a third hijacked plane, an American flight out of Washington, Dulles, crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames, the plane's wreckage tearing a gaping hole into one side of the building. Federal buildings are evacuated, government leaders taken to secure hideouts. 9.59 a.m., the until now unthinkable, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. An unknown number of people still trapped inside, including the rescuers, firefighters, and police who'd gone in trying to save lives. 
Then at 10 a.m., hundreds of miles away in western Pennsylvania, a fourth hijacked plane, a United flight out of Newark, crashes 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. One half hour later, 10.28 a.m., the north tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Rubble, debris spreading for blocks. In all, 266 people aboard four hijacked planes are killed. Untold others in Washington and New York missing and presumed dead. In New York, a defiant Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. For the first time in U.S. history, the Federal Aviation Administration closes all domestic airports, shutting down all U.S. airspace until at least noon tomorrow. The U.S. military and American embassies worldwide placed on the highest alert. Navy aircraft carriers and destroyers deployed along the eastern seaboard. The president, now in Louisiana, speaks for a second time. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. The president is then taken to the Secure Strategic Air Command in Nebraska, meets with his national security team via teleconference before boarding Air Force One to return to Washington. But in New York late this afternoon, a third damaged building, the 40-story World Trade Center No. 7, also crashes to the ground. And emergency officials allow the first camera crew from NBC News inside the smoking hulks of the Twin Towers. Ground zero, cars overturned, steel torn apart, glass shards, small fires still burning. The very picture America most feared, the image terrorist most wanted. As to who might be responsible, a senior American intelligence official tells NBC News tonight that they are now, and I'm quoting here, 90% certain that Osama bin Laden, the Saudi born terrorist, was responsible for today's attack. This official tells NBC News, quote, this is not just surmise, this is new information. The president plans to address the nation from Washington, D.C. tonight. Tom. Thank you very much, NBC's David Bloom. And we're going to go now to Washington where NBC's Campbell Brown, who covers the White House, is on duty, but across the street from the White House, the president is expected back there shortly. Campbell? Tom, the president is on his way back to Washington tonight. We're told that Air Force One is being escorted by F-15 fighter jets on each wing. As David said, he is planning to address the nation tonight. One aide says his message will be one of resolve and reassurance. And Tom, we are reporting to you tonight a block from the White House at a hotel. That's because those of us in the White House press corps, along with White House staff, were rushed out of the White House this morning as the entire complex was evacuated. Needless to say, this has been an extraordinary day for the president. One aide says when he spoke with his national security team in a live teleconference today, he said, quote, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences. Steel. Yes, steel. The president at a Sarasota, Florida elementary school, about to begin a reading event, gets first word shortly after 9 a.m. in a phone call from his national security advisor. One plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. Minutes later, Chief of Staff Andrew Card leans over and whispers in the president's ear. The reaction on Bush's face, the first sign of more horrifying news. A second plane has now hit the World Trade Center with all indications this is a terrorist attack. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. As Bush speaks, chaos at the White House. Staff and press are ordered to evacuate. People run from their offices across Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds pour into the streets as buildings nearby are evacuated. People gather around car radios for any information. Fire engines blaze toward the White House. Shortly after 9.30 a.m., the president's national security team is in the Situation Room, a secure communications center in the basement of the West Wing. Vice President Dick Cheney is there, along with national security advisor Condoleezza Rice. Meanwhile, the president leaves Florida, his destination at takeoff a secret. We later learn he's landed at Louisiana's Barksdale Air Force Base. There, he pledges, the U.S. will retaliate. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The president then flies to the Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, the U.S. Strategic Air Command Center. We're in a bunker there. He convenes a national security meeting, joining his team live by teleconference. Back in Washington, his top advisor, Karen Hughes, insists the White House has the situation under control. 
your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. By telephone, the president calls New York Mayor Giuliani and New York Governor Pataki. He also speaks with First Lady Laura Bush. The First Lady and Bush's two daughters are also rushed to secure secret locations. Mrs. Bush, on Capitol Hill when the attacks began, tries to offer words of reassurance. Well, parents need to reassure their children everywhere in our country that they're safe. We have just learned that Air Force One has safely landed at Andrews Air Force Base just outside of Washington. From our vantage point, we can see sharpshooters on the roof of the White House tonight, Secret Service patrolling the grounds, police cars driving up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House in a lockdown as we wait to hear what the president has to say to the nation. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC's Campbell Brown. And there are so many questions, but a major question tonight. How could they hijack four civilian jetliners in such a precise fashion? How do they pull all that off? Our aviation expert is NBC's Robert Hager, and he's standing by now in Washington as well. Robert? Tom, four airliners turned into deadly weapons. There's a nationwide hold now on all commercial flights. That's the first time that's ever happened in our nation's history. And it lasts at least until midday tomorrow and might last longer than that. And there are also some chilling first details of what may have been going on in those cockpits. But first, the facts. The string of events that results in these four horrific crashes begins at Boston's Logan Airport, 7.45 a.m. American Flight 11, 767, with 92 on board. Supposed to fly Boston to Los Angeles, but over New York State, it's diverted, forced to fly south, directly into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. A long day of carnage is underway. Back in Boston, United Flight 175, another 767, with 65 aboard, is already in the air, also bound for Los Angeles, 15 minutes behind the first flight, when it too is hijacked. This, the actual plane, as it hits the south tower of the World Trade Center. 8.10 a.m., American Flight 77, a 757 with 64 aboard, has taken off from Washington's Dulles Airport, also bound for Los Angeles. It, too, taken over and loops back into the Pentagon. It slices in at an angle, leaving a deadly and ugly gash in the nation's military nerve center. And finally, 8 a.m., out of Newark Airport, United's Flight 93, a 757 with 45 aboard, bound Newark to San Francisco, hijacked as well. But crashes short of whatever its intended target is, comes down in rural western Pennsylvania. Eyewitnesses there. And I heard a loud noise, and I happened to look up, and it was a plane, it was real low to me. It sounded like it was running fine to me. I just kept watching, I watched it go nosedive straight into the ground. You could see where the plane made the initial impact in the ground, and it was still on fire, it made a crater probably 30 feet by 30 feet, and it's probably 15 or 20 feet deep, and uh, there's just debris scattered within probably a half a mile radius. There are only two ways terrorists can sneak themselves or their weapons aboard planes, either through passenger screening or by going unscreened through locked doors into off-limits areas or onto the tarmac. Periodic FAA tests have found plenty of flaws. Found when government agents tried to sneak into secure areas, they were successful more than two thirds of the time. Found testers also often able to sneak fake guns and explosives by x ray screening. Once aboard, many speculate the hijackers must have disabled crews and taken over the plane's controls. More likely that than forcing a pilot with a gun at his head to fly right into the World Trade Center, for instance. Former American Airlines pilot Jim Tillman. It is inconceivable to me that any airline pilot would allow anyone to force him to fly into an inhabited building. I cannot imagine how any pilot could be conscious or capable of doing anything to control that airplane at the time that it was directed uh, at one of these buildings. Terrorism specialist Neil Livingstone. I suspect that what we're going to find is that the pilots were overwhelmed, uh, per perhaps dead already, and that trained pilots uh, uh, from the hijacker camp were in charge of those aircraft and were willing to die for their beliefs. If there was time, if there was, the crews may have been able to press a button in the cockpit and send out a coded warning to controllers that there was a hijack in progress. Controllers may then have radioed back inquiries, but if the crews were disabled, 
the controllers would have been left in the dark for real information. Whatever else, controllers must have been surprised, in disbelief. There hadn't been a commercial plane hijacked in the U.S. for 10 years, since 1991. And now this. There are several unconfirmed reports around that give little glimmers of what may have been going on in the cockpits. There's one from a controller in New Hampshire who says that a microphone was left on in the first plane of the day that was hijacked, that the pilot had his microphone keyed, so it was picking up the, uh, what was going on in the cockpit, and that the controller then, uh, off at the control center in New Hampshire, heard a terrorist say in English, don't do anything foolish. Then after that, the microphone went dead. The transponder of the plane went off. That's a device that uh, radios uh, information out to the radar so controllers could only watch the blip they could no longer tell what altitude the plane was at there were several cell phone calls from relatives on board uh, planes that who reached their relative on the ground one reported the terrorists had knife-like instruments and there was one unconfirmed report that an American Airlines flight attendant actually reached her company to say that terrorists had killed the crew of her plane Whatever else, we may know some more from the cockpit voice recorders, which could have survived those crashes and would give us an actual recording of what was going on uh, for audio in the cockpits. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Robert Hager. At the Pentagon right now, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Henry Schultz. Let's hear what he has to say. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman, that is uh, preceding Carl Levin, General I Shelton, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, talking about the institutions strong and our president. unity is strong and as war. We president. are on a war footing, in effect, in this country even though there has been no official declaration of any kind. But from a military point of view, political point of view, and certainly from a psychological point of view, we are at war with these terrorists. The question is, who are they? Within the intelligence community, all the fingers are pointing at Osama bin Laden, the very wealthy Saudi dissident who has been harbored by the Taliban, it's widely believed, in Afghanistan. Let's get more tonight on the continuing speculation about who is responsible from NBC's Andrea Mitchell now on her, at her post in the nation's capital. Andrea? Tom, tonight U.S. intelligence officials are mobilizing worldwide to try to find the culprits and make sure that they don't strike again. An attack on America coordinated with military precision, four planes, split-second timing, penetration of airports and airspace, no warning. They can destroy buildings, they can kill people, and we will be saddened by this tragedy, but they will never be allowed to kill the spirit of democracy. They cannot destroy our society. They cannot destroy our belief in the democratic way. The first question tonight, is it over? The terrible answer, despite billions spent on U.S. intelligence, the nation's top experts do not know where or when terrorists will strike next. The problem is, uh, that uh, they are hard to penetrate. Uh, they are located in places that we're very hard pressed to, to get any kind of information out of. And as hard as our agencies have tried, they've had some success. You don't hear about that. We only hear about the failure. Who could have done this? Before today, the worst failure, the attack on two U.S. embassies in Africa three years ago. Again, perfectly timed, no warning, 224 dead. The alleged mastermind, America's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden also involved, U.S. officials say, in helping the man convicted of bombing the World Trade Center, Ramzi Youssef, nine years ago, by protecting Youssef before and after that attack. Last winter, CIA Director George Tenet told Congress that bin Laden is capable of multiple attacks with little or no warning. Osama bin Laden and his global network of lieutenants and associates remain the most immediate and serious threat. Bin Laden's alleged millennium plots, 
planned attacks on three tourist areas in Jordan frequented by Americans, on Los Angeles International Airport, and on a U.S. destroyer in Yemen, all foiled. But six months later, terrorists do strike successfully, ram another destroyer, the USS Cole, killing 17. In June, bin Laden brags on this home video of killing U.S. sailors, a remarkable tape made to recruit more terrorists against America. And just three weeks ago, a warning to a London newspaper, allegedly from bin Laden's group, that he was targeting America again. I think it is a dilemma for the United States now. I believe the only thing is you know, to, to uh, revise their policies, to uh, look at the, what's happening, why, for example, the anti-American sentiment is very high in the Middle East and in the Muslim wars. How could this happen? Only from a massive intelligence failure. But in this case, at least there will be some evidence. The good news is that the uh, uh, hijacking four airplanes is a very complicated operation. Even hijacking one is complicated and they will have left some trail behind them. They will have had to have checked in, and they will have had to have purchased tickets either under their name or alias names. To learn how you can help victims of today's national tragedy, QBC urges you to call the American Red Cross at 1-800-HELP-NOW. That's 1-800-435-7669. QVC acknowledges today's events and expresses our heartfelt concern with this national tragedy. For more information, please turn to your TV news channel. In light of these events, QVC will be temporarily suspending its broadcast. Staff about how to proceed. Confident that the White House had been secured, he then headed back for Washington, determined to send a signal to the world that America would stand strong in the face of these horrible acts. And Dan, to more tough talk tonight from the president ahead of his address to the nation, a report just filed from aboard Air Force One. His spokesman quoting the president is saying, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences of taking on this nation. I say to them that the President of the United States will be making uh, some remarks to them this evening that will address those subjects. Mr. Secretary, you, you've declared, uh, the Pentagon has declared threat con delta forces around the world. Uh, could you tell me why? Have you, have you received any threats or has anyone claimed credit for this? Um, we, we have in fact uh, declared uh, force protection condition delta and a condition of high alert, indeed the highest alert. Uh, we did so almost immediately upon the attacks, and um, it is still in force. Mr. Secretary, were there threats, excuse me, issued against other U.S. facilities in, elsewhere in the world today? The, um, I, I don't know that there's a day that's gone by uh, since I've been in this job that there haven't been threats somewhere in the world to some facility somewhere. It's a... Uh, it's one of the uh, complexities of the intelligence business that you have to um, sort through those kinds of things. Um, but uh, uh, we don't get into the specifics, yes. You raise your hand? Yes. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, there were rumors earlier in the day that the plane which crashed in Pennsylvania had been brought down by the United States, either shot down or brought down in some other manner. We have uh, absolutely no information that any U.S. aircraft shot down any other aircraft today. I wonder if we could just ask Senator Levin one thing. You bet. That's, that's all right. Senator Levin, you and um, other Democrats in Congress <coughs> have, uh, have voiced fears that you simply don't have enough money for the large increase in defense the Pentagon is seeking, especially for missile defense. And you fear that you'll have to dip into the Social Security funds to pay for it. But does this kind of thing convince you that an emergency exists in this country to increase defense spending, to dip into Social Security if necessary, to pay for defense spending, increase defense spending? One thing uh, where the uh, uh, committee was unanimous on, uh, among many, many other things, was that the, uh, we, we authorized the full request of the president, including the $18 billion. So I would say that Democrats and Republicans have seen uh, the need for the request. Mr. Secretary, could you describe what steps are being taken, uh, defensive measures beyond force protection and whether there's been any operational planning for homeland defense 
an institution? Um, those aren't the kinds of things that one discusses. Sir, um, the uh, perpetrators of the Cobar Towers bombing were never found. Um, the coal bombing. We're uh, listening to a live news conference from the Pentagon, part of the Pentagon that wasn't hit by the attack today. And you can also see there the uh, presidential helicopter. President Bush has returned to Washington. Uh, he landed at Andrews Air Force Base a few minutes ago, and now he's going by chopper to the White House. He'll be addressing the nation shortly. Let's go back and hear what else the Defense Secretary has to say. Say okay. about today's yeah, attack. Elizabeth, the forty have talked about being ready. The military is ready. General Shelton said, and we understand the Navy has dispatched two carriers, and some guided missile cruisers and destroyers, and a couple of uh, main core uh, helicopter amphibious ships, such as the Bataan, if not the Bataan, uh, here and to New York. Uh, can you tell us that that's true, and also uh, any other things you can share with us about how the United States military uh, is preparing to take on whatever in the next few days? And we don't make announcements about ship deployments. Yes. Can you describe the firefighting efforts that are going on right now in that corridor and uh, search and rescue efforts that are beginning? Can I describe them? Yeah. Um, why don't we let the Secretary of the Army, who who's, was out there with me a few minutes ago and has been uh, talking to the incident commander uh, uh, on, the, on the site. I think it's fair to say at this point that the fire uh, is contained. Uh, and uh, will shortly, if not already, uh, be uh, sufficiently controlled to allow entry into the building. Uh, that entry will be uh, uh, supervised by the FBI, uh, who are in charge of the site, uh, assisted uh, by the uh, uh, fire uh, departments that are present. Uh, we, on the Army side, will support them uh, as they go in the building and uh, search uh, for casualties uh, and bring them out, uh, then we will support them in dealing with that. That's what's going on in the ground. We'll take one last question. Is the government operating under the assumption that this attack is done, or is it poised or, or bracing for more action? The, the government is certainly aware that uh, it's difficult to know when attacks are concluded. And um, I want to thank Senator Chairman Levin and uh, Senator Warner and certainly Secretary of the Army White and uh, General Shelton for, for being here with me. And we'll excuse ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there we are, a news conference live from the Pentagon involving uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the defense secretary there. He said this was an indication that we're functioning against a terrible act against us. Uh, he said uh, that there had been no attacks against Afghanistan by the Americans. There are reports from Kabul tonight that the city has come under attack, missile attack, rocket attack, but he denies the Americans were involved. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Shelton, said that uh, it was an act, an outrageous act of barbarism, today's attacks on New York and Washington, but he said their unity was strong and their confidence palpable. And then we heard from Senator John Warner, who said that this was the most tragic hour in America's history. But Senator Warner went on to say, but this can be our finest hour. You're watching BBC World News. You're watching BBC World on the day that terrorism again struck the United States with catastrophic loss of life. America under attack as hijacked planes crash into the heart of American power. Two rip through the twin towers of the World Trade Center. One after the other, the towers collapsed into rubble. The extent of casualties is still unclear. And then Washington, another plane crashes into a defense building at the Pentagon. Welcome to BBC World News. I'm Philip Hayton. Heavy loss of life and catastrophic destruction. That's the scene on the streets of New York after the United States suffers what's being described as the worst attack on the country since Pearl Harbor. A huge operation is underway to find survivors from the wreckage of both towers of the World Trade Center in New York. They collapsed after hijacked airliners with passengers on board were flown into them. The 47-story Salomon Brothers building, situated very close to the World Trade Center, has also collapsed. 
And part of the Defense Department, the Pentagon near Washington, continues to burn after another hijacked airliner plunged into it. The mayor of New York has said the casualties will be more than any of us can bear. There are no indications so far of who's behind the attacks. President Bush said those responsible would be hunted down. He's to address the nation in two hours' time, having just returned to the White House. It should have been a perfect day. But just before 9 o'clock, the pure blue sky over Manhattan was filling with smoke. A hijacked American airliner had just smashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. No one quite knew what had happened. Surely this must have been a terrible accident. But what happened next showed these were no accidents. A second hijacked airliner, a Boeing 767 with 92 people on board, is flying straight for the other tower. Now many hundreds of people must already have been dead, and the unfolding disaster could be seen all around New York. At that time, there would have been about 10,000 people in each tower of the World Trade Center, many thousands more in the Wall Street financial district all around. Those who could were running for their lives. I was just standing here watching the World Trade Center after the first after the first plane hit. I just saw a second plane come in from the south and hit the south tower halfway between the, the bottom and the top of the tower. It's got to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. When a, a big explosion happened, some guy came out, his, his skin was all off. I helped him out. This is him all over. There's people jumping out of windows. I've seen at least 14 people jumping out of windows. It's, it's, it's horrific. I can't believe this is happening. We heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out, and we saw the plane on the other side of the building, and there was smoke everywhere, and people were jumping out the windows. Over there, they're jumping out the windows, I guess, because they're trying to save themselves. I don't know. But it wasn't only New York and America's financial heart which was under attack. Now it was the nation's capital, too. In Washington, the Pentagon was hit, headquarters for the armed forces of the world's superpower. A third hijacked airliner, again with dozens on board, had been crashed with devastating results. By now, smoke was billowing around Capitol Hill, and the White House was being evacuated. People were talking of a new Pearl Harbor, someone declaring war on the United States. And back in New York, the nightmare was still far from over. Firefighters were in the basement of the World Trade Center, wondering if the building above was safe. The unthinkable was about to happen. The South Tower, all 110 stories, collapsed. And it was all live on American television. Thanks very much, Dan. collapsed. The whole side has collapsed? The whole building has collapsed. The whole building has collapsed? The building has collapsed. That's the southern tower you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. The second building that we witnessed the airplane enter. On the ground, emergency services hardly knew which way to turn. People still trapped in the second tower had seen it all and could only wave in desperation. But it was already too late for rescue. The second tower, representing America's trade and wealth, was about to go. The twin towers, which took seven years to build, had been utterly destroyed in a single morning. The Manhattan skyline and countless lives devastated.
Everything fine till we got to the basement and then everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped under there when another guy crawled out, kept getting hit in the head, had bags slowed around, finally we clawed our way out over the rubble. Yeah. Come on, Dan. Right. All right, Come wait a minute, Tom. Let's go. Even the bloodied felt incredibly lucky on this terrible day. And firefighters could embrace each other for a few moments before facing many more hours of trauma. As New York struggled to cope, to adapt to the clogging dust, the fallout of so much tragedy. More news was coming in, a fourth crashed airliner in Pittsburgh. And somehow, American government seemed almost powerless amidst all this. The centers of that power had been evacuated, key congressional leaders taken to secret locations. The president himself whisked to a nuclear bunker in Nebraska, shaken but pledging somehow to find those who masterminded this day of mayhem and massacre. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. And freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Hours after the attacks, the United States, the whole world, is struggling to take it all in. There's really no more rescue the firemen can seriously attempt. It's now a question of salvage amid the wreckage. Suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Crime scenes have been established by the federal authorities in New York, in Washington, D.C. area, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, and in Newark. The full resources of the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Prisons, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of Justice Programs are being deployed to investigate these crimes and to assist survivors and victim families. Thousands of FBI agents in all of the field offices across the country and in the international Legat offices, assisted by personnel from other Department of Justice agencies, are cooperating in this investigation. The FBI has established a website where people can report any information about these crimes. That address is www.ifccfbi.gov. That address again www.ifccfbi.gov. Individuals can report any information they know about these crimes to that website. It takes courage for individuals to come forward in situations like this, and I urge anyone with information that may be useful and helpful to authorities to use this opportunity. Sneak attack on the United States, this time by the shadowy personages uh, who are part of the terrorism operation. There are a number of terrorism operations in the world. Osama bin Laden is the, has been the focal point since 1998 of uh, U.S. intelligence suspicions, but we've said it before, 
We repeat it without apology. No one knows who is responsible for these dastardly acts today. Uh, three of the World Trade Center buildings, the two Twin Towers and uh, Building 7, uh, destroyed at the World Trade Center. The Pentagon uh, dead, wounded, and destruction there. Now, coverage of the attack on America continues, including President Bush's address shortly, so stay right here with us. Continuing now our live CBS Evening News coverage of the attack on America from CBS News World Headquarters in New York. Four commercial jets hijacked and deliberately crashed today. Three of them hit buildings, two the World Trade Center Twin Towers, uh, a third hit the Pentagon, the fourth hijacked airliner went down in southwestern Pennsylvania. New York's towering World Trade Center reduced to rubble. The Pentagon smashed and smoking, uncounted thousands of people apparently dead or injured. In New York, it's described as a catastrophe in terms of dead and wounded. The figures are unknown. Here's what's happening right now. Rescue workers are scrambling through the war zone remains of lower Manhattan as well as the Pentagon itself. On a normal day, up to 50,000 people worked in the Twin Towers alone, and many thousands of visitors went through each day. Casualty figures elsewhere include the more than 250 passengers and crew on the four hijacked jets, and perhaps 100 dead and injured, at least at the Pentagon. But there are few places in the air tonight anywhere in the United States. There are few planes in the air anywhere because the FAA has grounded all civilian aircraft until at least noon tomorrow. Nothing is supposed to fly until at least noon tomorrow when the FAA will have some further information. By the way, the stock exchanges will also be closed uh, tomorrow. President Bush will address the nation from Washington tonight. Uh, it originally was scheduled for 9 o'clock Eastern time. We're told that that will be moved up some exactly when the president has uh, now decided to speak. We do not know. We expect it at any time, and we will, of course, carry it live here. President Bush has already promised to, quote, find and punish whoever carried out these cowardly attacks. And federal officials say, not all of the intelligence agencies, but some federal officials say they, quote, strongly suspect that renegade Saudi millionaire Osama bin Laden may have been involved, but there's no confirmation of that whatsoever. And if you're concerned about hearing some reports of U.S. missile strikes in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, didn't happen, according to senior U.S. officials. Uh, what happened in Kabul, Afghanistan, the pictures of explosion and fire there, had nothing to do with any U.S. missile attacks. There haven't been any U.S. missile attacks. While at least one news organization reported that missiles had hit Kabul, Afghanistan, it turns out to be not true. CBS News correspondent Scott Pelley is at the site of today's attacks in lower Manhattan tonight. And as night falls, Scott, what's the situation there? Dan, as you can see, the smoke is still rising on lower Manhattan Island as night falls here. We have spent most of the day with firemen, paramedics, and police officers near the World Trade Center towers. One of the firefighters told us that he didn't see any bodies in the area. He just saw pieces of bodies, pieces of bodies, he told us, in the street, on the sidewalks. I asked him if he could give us some idea of how many bodies, and he just shook his head sadly and said, far too numerous to have any idea. We have spent a great deal of time with the firefighters. They all describe a scene of overwhelming devastation near ground zero at the base of the World Trade Center towers. Firefighters describe bodies in the streets, bodies on the sidewalks, pieces of bodies everywhere. One New York City police chief said, no one has ever seen anything like this unless they were at Dresden in World War II. It's a terrible thing. Sight. The world is evil, definitely. One block from the base of the World Trade Center Tower, the inferno burned four hours after the attack. Police cars, the first to respond, were incinerated by the collapse of the second tower. Many firefighters and officers were wounded in the collapse, perhaps killed. No one can say how many. No idea how many people in cops are dead. Yeah, many people hurt. What about the casualties? What have you seen? Uncountable. Let's go, let's go. Courageous firefighters responded from all over New York City, called from off-duty, called from vacation. Rene Davila was the first EMS supervisor at the scene. I was there, and I saw the building collapse. We all started running. 
I, I, like, I ended up inside the Hilton somewhere. I was like trapped. I don't know where I was. I, I couldn't find my way out with all the smoke and the debris in there. I finally just closed the door behind me and covered it so no more smoke and debris would come in. And what I did was I called my wife. I told her I love her. Anybody want to volunteer? Many New Yorkers rushed downtown to volunteer. These construction workers were from Iron Workers Local 40. What's the job in there? Whatever it is. Whatever it is. To save somebody. One person saved is a life saved. Through the day, an inferno raged in World Trade Center Building Number 7, another massive office tower. Firefighters feared that it would collapse. And a little more than eight hours after the attack, the abandoned building fell. 47 stories in the street. This is what's left of the carefully organized files and lives that were the World Trade Center. Bits of paper blasted into the street, construction dust an inch or two inches deep everywhere you look. What's eerie about this place now, several hours after the initial disaster, is just how quiet it is. You don't hear any ambulances racing away from the World Trade Center anymore. I saw many injuries. Hundreds, thousands. My eyesight did not see hundreds and thousands. I know that my heart and my brain tells me they were hundreds. One of the sites that we noticed near ground zero tonight, it is election day in New York City, a primary election. And near a community center, someone had handwritten a sign that said, vote here. Right below that sign, someone had scrawled another that said, emergency shelter. Dan? Scott Pelley in lower Manhattan. The primary mayoral election in New York was canceled today. Uh, the White House has now informed us that President Bush, moving uh, up his time to speak, is now scheduled to speak to the American public and, for that matter, to the world at 8.30 Eastern Time, uh, you know, less than an hour from now. 8.30 Eastern Time, President Bush will be addressing the nation. Uh, that, of course, will be 7.30 in the central time zone um, and even earlier, of course, out west. 8.30 now. Not far enough. One after another, the towers fell to pieces, debris falling onto hundreds of onlookers. Somewhere behind the billow of smoke, an American icon had disappeared, transforming the New York skyline forever. On the sidelines, people watched and wept. Others covered in soot and debris come on, can you stop for? Come on. counted their blessings. Even now, no one can guess the number of dead and wounded. Adding to the confusion, cell service was crippled, cutting the lifeline for families trying to locate loved ones. Only a few could get through. It's going to be okay. Nearby schools evacuated so quickly, parents had no idea where to go to find their children. Everywhere, there was terror and confusion. Everybody, please. Finally, people simply walked away from Lower Manhattan. An eerie calm prevailed as police evacuated the area. Cell phone service for much of New York City is still somewhat crippled, though the situation is getting better. Several forms of transportation have been affected. Several subway lines are suspended indefinitely, and train service out of the city is limited. It will be no business as usual for school kids in New York City tomorrow. All New York City public schools are closed at least for tomorrow. And the mayor of New York said earlier today, stay home and stay calm. At least. Now an eyewitness report from one of our own. Minutes after the initial attacks on the World Trade Center towers, CBS News correspondent Carol Marine was on the scene, just in time for a frighteningly close encounter with catastrophe. As I'm making my way toward the Trade Center um, along the, the water line, thousands of people were walking towards me, uh, streaming out, almost not talking, trying to, or trying to get through on cell phones that didn't work, some of them crying, all of them looking pretty agonized. All of a sudden, I heard a roar, and I saw one of the towers blow and then collapse and fill the horizon with smoke and I yelled, oh my God. And I saw from street level as though it had exploded up a giant rolling ball of flame and the firefighters screamed, run. And I turned to run, but I fell and I felt someone scoop me up 
tell me to throw my high heels off, and I was running in my stocking feet with him. And finally, as we ran and ran, he slammed me into a wall and covered my body with his. I could feel his heart beating against my backbone. And I think both of us were sure we were dead because there was no way you could run fast enough and there was no way to avoid it. But somehow we escaped the flame, which was immediately followed by a storm of debris. Um, we were breathing, it felt like giant particles of plaster and there was smoke so that if you tried to put your hand out in front of you, you couldn't really see it. You, it was the thickest, most intense particle and smoke I've ever been in. And somewhere along the line, the firefighter handed me off to a New York police officer. The thing that struck me, though, was that I didn't see many wounded people in the street, which led me to believe, at least where I was by the Trade Center, they had never even gotten out of the building. I thought I was going to die. It is as close as I've ever come as a reporter to thinking I was going to die. Carol Marine of 60 Minutes 2, CBS News correspondent. The shock of this morning's attack on America.